This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I have a wonderful guest on the phone uh, today. In fact, uh, back in 1984, she celebrated 16 candles. <laughs> <laughs> passing notes to her pal Mo Molly Ringwald in class, who was trying to sleep. Folks, I give you the lovely and talented and uh, currently bird-sitting <laughs> Leanne Curtis. How do you do, Leanne? Bonjour. C'est moi, <laughs> Leanne Curtis. Comment allez-vous? <laughs> I'm doing great. What's going on over there in New Brunswick, Oh, Canada. Can I defect now, please? Sure. I'm coming. Are you ready? Yeah. I don't like it here anymore. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, maybe it's... we should stay away from all that. <laughs> Let's talk about nonsense. It's less dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now you you don't mo you're almost stuck in the middle of the third act of Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. <laughs> well, I, you know I've been stuck in this movie for mm, a while now. My oldest bird is 30 years old, <laughs> and I actually gave her to the makeup artist from Rock and Roll High School Forever because my bird decided that she liked Karen, and I had two toddlers at the time who are now 25 and 20, going to be 28 at the end of May. Yikes. <laughs> and 26 in August. Wow, I can't believe I have adult males roaming the earth, hopefully being responsible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I don't need to be called grandma anytime soon. Thank you. No. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. I just got done 28 years of doing time as a mom, and now I'm free. Uh oh! <laughs> Look out, world! She's free. Have you oh have you ever been uh, out this way, out New Brunswick, Canada? No, I have not. Although I read a series of books once that took place in Manitoba, Canada, and I know it's really, 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 really cold up there. But I'd, I'd kind of like to see it with my eyes once before I exit. Okay. Well. You know, I always say that our, probably our closest celebrities are the trailer part boys. So if you know who they are, you may have a handle of uh, what's it like up here. Wow. Okay. Well, I'll, I will be admittedly ignorant to this. <laughs> Please explain. Oh, they, they've had uh, like 11 seasons of their uh, show, and they've done three movies. Ivan Reitman produced their first one. Wow. Yeah. Well, see, look at what happens when you're all like up in your bird hole. Yeah. Put your head up your own bird hole, and then you miss these fabulous things. Yeah, but speaking of fabulous things. Uh-oh. Are we going to talk about me again? Yeah, I'm we're going to talk about you. We're going to talk about <laughs> 16 Candles because uh, it's my favorite John Hughes film. Is it? <laughs> yes. John was a very special human being. You yeah. Know, I'm, I'm very I, – I, I wish he were still here. And I wish he were still creating content. But that, you know, I just, I went uh, and took a left when you wanted to probably go straight. So have at it. Give me questions. I will have answers. Well, John Hughes, it's unfortunately we lost him and kind of lost him really suddenly. What was it like working with him? He's a big kid, or he was a big kid. He probably is still a big kid, just a disembodied big kid floating around somewhere doing something. But yeah, I mean, he was a big kid. Nice guy, super talented, very funny, very witty. Um, um, I don't, you know, he was, he was, he was a lot of fun to work with, and um, it's a shame. It's definitely a loss. Well, how did you get the part uh, in um, Sixteen Candles? Is it just a standard edition? Pretty much standard audition, went to the casting director, then went to the casting director and the director, then went back in to the casting director, director, and Molly was in the room, and then um, I had to go pick up my driver's license because I had left it in an envelope, and really it was, it was preferable to go back down to Universal than to go stand online at the DMV. So when I went to pick it up, John happened to be there and told me face-to-face -face on the spot that I had booked the job, which is 
fairly irregular because usually you just get the phone call from the agent and there's a protocol, but, you know, that was kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. Of course, uh, I love that sequence in the classroom where uh, you're passing notes and Molly is just not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're like half asleep, and uh, of course the note ends up in the wrong hands, and uh, you can't explain it. <laughs> I like little things like that out of John Hughes. He brings a real reality, whereas a lot of movies of that kind are very um, formulaic. I like right. Yeah. Well, I think John had a knack for including, like basically stuff that you couldn't make up if you wanted to, right? So he had a way of incorporating stuff like that, but did it in, I mean, he stayed in formula, but the way he did it was good because it ended up being like a subtext kind of thing, and it just made it seem very natural. But it's true. I mean, art imitating life. Things happen. Notes fall into the wrong hands. <laughs> Emails are pressed. People hit reply all or cc instead of bcc and the next thing you know 100 emails that weren't supposed to be public to one another are oops i take it, it you've happens. had that problem uh-huh <laughs> uh-huh yeah there's nothing worse than having pressed a button and not be able to undo it you just want to recoil into your own little skin like so deep that you feel like you're under a boulder and never want to come out horrible in like in the moment that feeling is just the worst awful let's not talk about that <laughs> <laughs> well in the movie you of course are playing the best friend to molly ringwald and of course you've got it all together while well, she is fretting over her 16th birthday which everybody has forgotten and i'm going to tell you one of the things that john hughes many things that john hughes did that i really loved in this movie is the fact that in a standard movie everybody would jump out in the end and they'd say surprise and she'd be all oh i can't believe i uh, y'all remembered blah 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 but he didn't do that they actually all forgot her birthday and of course it led to that beautiful father-daughter moment with Paul Dooley where he comes down stairs at night when she's on the couch and he says, I'm sorry, we, we forgot your birthday. And it was right. just... A well, I mean, and that's John Hughes's knack. We'll go right back again to, you know, being able to marry, a, you know, a human moment. The things that happen make sense. Everything psychologically makes sense. The characters do things that make sense, you know, so he's he, he worked everything out. The development of the characters and the story and the subtext were all all point big time, you know? Always. He had an act for doing that in all of his movies. Yeah. Of course, you, you were lucky because two, two of the cast members ended up getting detention in the next film. You managed to avoid detention. <laughs> Probably because of my bad behavior on the set, but that's another story that <laughs> you may or may not want into which you oh. may or may not want to delve. There oh, yeah, please tell. <laughs> oh, I was such a brat. I was just such a little little hellion. I was a very rebellious little only child. And, and at that time, it took the form of uh, shock value. So I did things like jump in the pool at the hotel with all my clothes on, and the manager of the hotel didn't like that, so the executive producer had to, quote, have another talk with Leanne, unquote. <laughs> you know, I was just a little uppity. <laughs> and it was harmless stuff, really. I mean, as uh, somebody who's become a good friend says, as long as you don't make a life or take a life, well, I didn't do either of those two things. I really didn't. I just sort of maybe was a little mischievous when it was unnecessary to do so. But that's okay. We live and we learn. Were you mischievous with Molly Ringwald? Um, <laughs> uh, no, she, she, it was more a matter, I think, of, of Molly. I mean, if I'm going to be really candid, Molly became privy to my mischief. And, and um, so then it became public knowledge. And then it sort of spiraled from there. And 
Um, unfortunately, I never had the privilege of being in another John Hughes film. So, you know, if you just take a big look at the picture and how it went down, it speaks for itself. So live and learn. Behave yourself, and then you'll get invited back. Don't, and you won't. You know? That's it. Cause and effect. <laughs> I thought it was funny, poor Molly Ringwald being uh, in that one, that scene, uh, being felt fell up by her grandparents. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, very comical scene. Um, what was it like working with her? With Molly? Yeah. She was very professional, and she's a nice young lady. Yeah, I had another person was saying that she's very, very classy, and the person was saying this, uh, said that she wasn't classy, and she, I guess she had said that she had told Molly, you should try to dress more like me, and then she said that, that Molly looked at her and said, no. <laughs> yeah, Molly's got a very strong personality, and she's very confident, and, you know, she's good at what she does. Yeah, I love the red hair. I gotta say that. I love that first opening shot. You see you. You see the 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 facial freckles. Uh, everything's very very natural, you know. And uh, and it's kind of interesting how John Hughes come to to cast her, you know, and and how he come to rely on her. And and uh, well, three of three of his movies he had her in. So that's absolutely correct. It was a love affair of sorts. Not not. <laughs> Not in the biblical sense, ew, no, but in a creative sense. They uh, they created a lot of really memorable films and moments for millions and millions of people, um, which actually will likely hold up through generations and years because the things that he touched upon are all universal, basically. Yeah, that movie had a great cast. In addition to you and uh, Molly Ringwald, uh, of course, every everybody asks about Michael Schofling, who... Um... Oh, <laughs> yes, the reclusive Michael Schofling, who went and left the business to go have a real life. He's the smart one. He's happy. You know, if he's stressed out, it's not about the same ego-driven things that anybody who's stayed in... Yeah. continue to have i mean he's allowed to age if he wants to get pudgy he can do it the camera isn't on him all the time nobody cares you know what he's wearing he's you know he got out yeah, he's yeah, probably yeah. a much happier human being and you know what god bless him if he is you know sometimes i'm sure he is yeah he'd have come back if he weren't yeah well no that's great um, what, what what was your uh, time like working with him? Obviously, he was the one, the recipient of the note. <laughs> oh, my God. What a sweet, gentle human being. That man is probably still sweet and gentle and loving and real, non-pretentious. He's just a good guy. There need to be more people like him on the planet, I think. I really liked him in the Bring film. Bringing off energy well. now because I don't know him well. Yeah. But it's just a vibe that I picked up off of him to sound really cheesy and L.A. and flaky. But he's a good egg. He's a very gentle, 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 gentle soul. Lovely human being. And then we have, of course, Anthony Michael Hall, <laughs> who just came off National Lampoon's vacation and uh, is, uh, has a great chance to uh, annoy Molly Ringwald to the extremes. But again, you have these wonderful little moments like in the shop, like when they leave the dance and she, she's in that car in the shop garage. And, and you got a nice, wonderful, honest moment between her and uh, Anthony Michael Hall, who Again, you get to see his human. And, of course, he's very funny in the movie, palling around, of course, with a young John Cusack and uh, huh. and uh, Darren Harris. Yep. Yeah, what are your memories of Anthony Michael Hall? <laughs> I still text him and we volley and say hi every once in a while. I'll check in with him and we'll talk. I haven't really seen him, although I'd like to. Um, I'd love to say hi. Um, I actually almost went to Dana Barron 
another 80s actress. She was in vacation with him. Yeah. She had a birthday, and I was invited, and I was not able to make it, which is too bad. And somebody snapped a picture and texted it to me, and everybody was kind of waving, and there he was. So I'm sorry I didn't get to see him on that day. But um, what a good kid he was, you know, really super, super, super talented, still super talented. I like that you end up uh, wearing that little braces thing in his mouth. Wakes up the next morning, got things in. Yep, the night brace. I had to wear one of those for a while. They're not fun. I'll tell you somebody I did like in the film, and again, another tribute to uh, how good a writer John Hughes was. I loved Havilon Morris, who, of course, played Aww. the... yeah. Um, I wanted to get her on here a couple of years ago, and um, I guess she didn't really have much more new to offer, and I felt so sad because I wanted to get her on. And I and uh, I came here at the station one evening. I think I think she knew I was a uh, little disappointed I couldn't get her on here. But uh, I came to the station one night, and somebody had said that there was some mail for me, and uh, I got this envelope and opened it up, and there was an autographed picture of Havilon Morris, which I thought was really nice. She's another really good egg, a genuinely sweet, lovely, loving human being. I love Havilon. Also somebody I don't know well, and again, I'm just working off people's energy. She's not fake, you know? It's not the, oh, I love you, kind of Hollywood crap, you know? Um, and I had the privilege and honor of taking my daughter to go see her daughter, Faith Score, who's a wonderful ballet dancer, perform um, at uh, UCLA with okay. um, the Los Angeles Ballet Company. So there you go. It was really, really lovely to be able to um, to see what her progeny is up to or you know well i'm gonna say I've... one of the things i really loved about again um another tribute to john hughes is the fact that when we first see Havilon moore's character of course she's the one that's you know the the cheerleader type dating the michael shuffling character and of course i guess uh, molly ringwald sees her as kind of the object in the way here's what i like though even though she's a little snitty with um Schelfling, I like the fact that we're we're allowed to like her, and there's a key scene in the movie where Molly Ringwald's sitting out in the the corridor while the dance is going on, and she brushes tears away, and there comes uh, Havilon Morris with a couple other girls walking by, and rather than make some snide comment, she waves and says hello, which uh, in another movie it would not happen like that, but I like the fact. We get to right, see her. Right, there would have been a sneer, or some bitchy little whatever. But yeah, yeah, no. Again, it's like people are human, and John was so clever at being able to bring that out. You know. Yeah, uh, I guess she wore a wig during the scene where her hair Thank got God. jammed in the door. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's like some kind of like a hair snuff movie where you just like actually cut the actor's hair and don't tell them you're going to do it. That's just horrible. That's like, wait, I, that's that's kind of a really awful thing to say. <laughs> hair snuff. Okay. Well, it actually would be, though, because you're killing somebody's haircut live and on camera. Yeah. But I, I have got... a very twisted sense of humor. I'm sorry, and I have no filter. So apologies to any listeners if there's something offensive that exits my pie hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I loved her in the movie, and of course, I loved the fact that she um, <laughs> the, she ended up in the car, although she was intoxicated, being driven around by an underage Michael, uh, Anthony Michael right. Hall. Taking birth control pills in his mouth. I mean, that's just like, <laughs> what? That's my kind of thing. I love, let's see, the, the more nonsense, the better for me. Absolutely. If it's wrong, then it's so right. Yeah. I will laugh till I cry. The more wrong, the better. Another cast member I got to bring up, and it, I'm I, I'm going to get this person's name wrong. Uh, is it maybe Get? Not. Getty, maybe not. Maybe not. Have faith, young man. Is it Getty's wannabe? <laughs> Did I get it right? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Getty wannabe. You oh. know, I like that. I want to make that his name now. It's oh. actually. Getty Watanabe. Oh, I got it wrong. 
but that's okay. It's okay. Like if you break it down into syllables, yeah. Like and just go wa ta na be. It's four syllables. It's good. But I love Getty Wannabe. I love that. That makes me so happy. <laughs> All right, good. And I'm not making fun of you. I just it just it it just struck a little funny chord. That's all. Good for you. Well, he struck Thank a funny you. chord, too. And laughed. He, he struck a funny chord, too, all through the movie. No kidding, man. He walked into that audition, and first of all, and I, I probably shouldn't say this, you know, we're all walking around, and we're 18 and 16, and, you know, and here comes Getty. <laughs> and he's, you know, the old man, but nobody knew. Because <laughs> he looks so freaking young, man. He's probably 700 years old and, like, still looks like he's 30. It's really crazy. But that's okay. Somebody's got to not age. It might as well be Getty. Yeah, and he... we're all going to be wannabes because we're all going to want to be like Getty. <laughs> oh, yeah. <he> had... <laughs> not age. Yay. Okay, sorry. There's that stream of consciousness thing I warned you about. Um, but no, he's a very funny young man and he went into the audition and did not speak any English at all, except very broken English and pretended like he was having a hard time understanding. And then, I mean, he, can I have a curse word? Do sure, I get a curse go, word? go ahead. He totally mind fucked all of them, man. He was in there going, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, my name is uh, 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 Getty Watanabe. Uh, and he's just like, he played the whole character, like the whole time. He was Long Duck Dong. <laughs> you know, and I don't know. I mean, it would have been fabulous. And to me, it would have been the point on the exclamation if at the end of his audition, he would have said, Thanks, guys, like that. But I don't think he did. I think he stayed in character the whole time. And then I think when he showed up to set or wherever, and he finally just spoke like a normal person from America, <laughs> they were kind of flabbergasted. But I love that story. That's one of my favorite stories. Of course, he went on to be in that Weird Al Yankovic movie, UHF, as well. He was very funny in that. But, of course, he played, of course, Long Duck Dong. What a name. Of course, he's what a name. I know, but see, and there's, again, it's like, John, really? Long Duck Dong? Come on, man. <laughs> uh-huh. Boy, Good for you. Boy, did he ever get corrupted at that party. <laughs> yeah. That's right. On the exercise bike with Debbie. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And then jumping out of the tree on the Michael Schofling. Yeah, but he mm -hmm. missed. He missed. <laughs> yep. Fabulous. Fabulous moments. And then we have Blanche Baker, of course, playing um, Molly Ringwald's sister, who ends oh up God, having... <laughs> too many meds at her... <laughs> playing with her lip and the whole nine yards and then little poltergeist. Oh, my God. The whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, you had, um, you had Justin Henry, of course, playing the brother. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I like about like about him in Kramer versus Kramer. I know we want to talk about Sixteen Candles a lot, a lot, a lot, and yeah. there's a reason because Sixteen Candles is awesome, awesome, awesome. But yeah. just Henry, what a performance they got out of him in that movie. Yes, what an amazing thing at such a young age to be able to work with Dustin Hoffman and Meryl Streep like that. Goodness gracious! And then he went on to work with you and Molly. Yeah, okay. Hmm, let's see. If we put that on the scale of impression, like impressed, like, you know, let's be impressing people. I, I think, I think Justin and Meryl kind of win. What, what if we throw in know. Long Duck Dong? Long Duck Dong <laughs> will always win, but he's got his own special category. <laughs> <laughs> the Duck Dong category. Yeah, and we and have... Lampoon. We have both of the Cusack Award for Duck Dong. <laughs> we have both of the Cusacks in this as well, so of course. Yes, we do. Yeah, poor Joan and John have just worked together like like forever. I like the relationship they have, and uh, of course she uh, had this neck brace on. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a gif of that actually. If you go, I don't know if you you know. I know you're on Facebook. Um, but if you go into the private messages, maybe I'll send you one. I'll send you the gif if I can find it. I'll send you the gif of Joan and that girl dancing like back and forth at the dance. Yeah. 
I made a gif of that. There's also a gif of me in Girlfriend from Hell with my eyes rolling all red and crazy. I found that once and sent it to somebody. Well, they they had some uh, really like uh, like Paul Dooley was really great as the oh, father, I you know. Love Paul. Yeah, yeah. He, like I said, one my, one of my favorite moments in the movie is where where he says to Molly Ringwald, there he, he comes down, and sees her on the couch, and says, "We forgot your birthday," and it was just a real moment, and it was uh, very special, and and he was fantastic, you know, given that great scene in the movie. Yeah, because nobody was acting. Everybody was just really talking and really listening, and everybody was in the moment, and it was just relaxed, and it was, I don't know, man, just the whole thing was so well done, even with my ridiculous behavior. Um, you know, great film, great experience. We can't, we can't, we can't stop talking about this film without discussing those four grandparents, so. though. <laughs> It's Billy Bird and Carol Cook and Edward Andrews and Max Showalter, all those guys, yeah. Love them. Rest in peace, whoever's not here, and yay for whoever still is. You got any stories to share about them? I know Molly. <laughs> Molly would... You know, I didn't really get to see them much because I didn't have scenes with them, so it's not okay. like I put in any real time with them. Okay, I, I didn't know whether... I would like to yeah. because I actually... Um, I come from a family who's been doing this for, you know, over a century, and my grandparents hung out with people like Jack Benny, and they, you know, so Carol Cook and that whole generation is the generation after my grandparents, you know, and I, I feel like there's so much to be learned um, if you just sit quietly and listen to these people talk and share their experience with you. I mean, it's just, it's not the same anymore, and there's a certain kind of classy, old school yeah just thing it just doesn't exist it just doesn't it's not it doesn't it's not here anymore and it's i miss it it makes me feel safe and probably because um it relates back to childhood right and and how one was brought up and by whom and who you were around like a little tea bag and water and stuff so it's just always interesting to me to be able to talk to older people do you have a favorite moment in uh, Sixteen Candles, specifically uh, something that you filmed or uh, an experience that just stood out to you uh, during that film? You know, sadly, here we go. It's here's. I'm still such a little jerk. <laughs> I, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, they had PG. They they had to. They were only allowed to have one fuck, and they gave it to Molly with. I can't believe they. <laughs> fucking forgot my birthday or whatever it was right there right yeah but originally on the bleachers when i'm sitting with jonathan chapin the line as written and i'm looking at the script right now was geek get the fuck out of here <laughs> that was my favorite and it got taken away oh <laughs> Gee, oh, oh, Leanne, and your little f bomb affinity. You, you, you. Yeah, now you'll have to reevaluate your friendship with Molly. She took your moment. <laughs> she took my f bomb. Well, to be honest, she also took my wardrobe. <laughs> Molly, you took my wardrobe. Your little pink dance outfit. That was mine, and she decided she liked it. So John had to go shopping literally the day before with Marla. I think her name was. Um, to go find me my little jeans mini skirt and the sweater and I tried it on and Marla had to stay up all night sewing beads or whatever the hell it was she's had to sew something on there I don't know what it was but like it's okay it's well, okay <laughs> Randy was more of a short jeans tight jeans skirt than a, a, a little fluffy flouncy pink light pink thing I think it was probably a better character choice as far as wardrobe for Molly ultimately so well before we mention some of your other films i just wanted to to get your take on the fact oh. that that um 16 candles like it's it's still very very popular to this day and it always I, will be as long as there's an awkward teenager alive mm -hmm. it will be an appropriate film to a relevant film rather there's no, there's some very inappropriate things in that film, but um, yeah, no, 
as long as there's a teenager walking the earth, I believe this movie will be irrelevant. What What do you think about the phenomenon that this this movie uh, carrying through here to 2017? Well, I think it's exactly what I just said because you know, as long as there's an awkward teenager going through crushes and all that stuff, it's just you know. It, it's what happens at a certain age. It happens to all of us, and there's just that whole middle school, high school hierarchy, trying to be cool, trying to fit in, but trying to stand out, but trying to, you know, stay under the radar, but be a leader, but no, don't, be a lemming, be, oh, my God. I I couldn't deal with it. So, but yes, as long as any of that continues, that movie will be relevant. And so the phenomenon is, it's, you know, like we said, all the human moments in that film is what keep it going. Well, I do have to ask about some of your other films. Of course, you did um, Baby It's You. In fact, you did a couple Mm. of films with John Siles, or Sales, Mm -hmm. excuse me. John Sales, my favorite. Yeah. He, I'm sorry, every other director I've worked with, well, there's another one that popped into my head, Michael Rhodes. I loved working with Michael Rhodes mm-hmm. as well, a very interesting human being. Um, but that's another story. But John Sayles, Baby, It's You. I love John. I love John. Mm-hmm. I will always love John. Um, I think that given the opportunity, if somebody were to tell me, you can work with John Sayles, but there's absolutely no money. It'll actually cost you money. And if I didn't have the money, I would go find the money. I would pay to work with John Sales. I love him that much. He's such an amazing director. He's a fabulous writer. He's such an intelligent, non-ego-based human being. He and his partner, Maggie, and I say partner in all senses of the word, those guys have been together forever. Um, what a functional, beautiful relationship those two have. Um, it's a working relationship. It's an intimate relationship. It's everything. Um, he's really, and he's so on the DL too. You know, you don't see him on TMZ. You don't, it's, it's none of that. It's just real. Mm -hmm. It's just real. He's just real. There's nothing fake about those people. And they would rather make a movie for twenty thousand dollars that's a good movie than be given ten million dollars to make some blockbuster bullshit. Yep. Oh, well, I agree. You know? I and, agree. And I will always respect that. You know. Well, it's interesting because uh, he had you back, baby. It's you and brother from another planet. <laughs> right. And guess what? Brother from another planet was the very first time my phone rang. And hi, this is uh, Lynn Kressel's office. Hi, John Sales would like to offer you a part. And I thought. Are you glad I'm sitting down, man? <laughs> that was awesome. That was my very first Stone Cold offer without having to anything. I love working for John. Well, Somehow, I, I don't think he's listening to this whenever this airs. Whatever day it is now, today, even though it's not today, it's sometime in the future from today. <laughs> That's very confusing, audience members. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, tell me about your experience on Baby It's You and uh, Brother from Another Planet. Mm. Well, Baby It's You was the very first feature film I had ever um, been invited to work. Um, And it was a supporting role in the first half of the film. And I was very concerned about not being able to cry because even though I had been in acting class and continued to be in acting class after Baby It's You, um, I still had never really been on a film set and I was just, you know, I was a newbie. I didn't know what I was doing, you know. So I told John that I was a little scared and he said not to worry. And I thought, oh, great, this guy, he thinks I know more than I do. And, like, now I'm going to get caught red-handed. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm green. I'm this. I'm that. Oh, my God. And all these crazy thoughts just rushing through my head. And I'm sitting there on the floor, and they've put the fake blood on my hands. And I'm just, you know, put myself in this little sort of pile on the corner. And um, John kicks everybody out except for Michael Ballhouse. 
and Tony Adler, the first AD. Yep. And then he says, you're going to do what I do. And he stands up in the window, which is a very high window because it was a high school bathroom. So the window is about, you know, shoulder height maybe Mm -hmm. is where the bottom of the window is. And he's standing up there in the window frame. And he screams. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, is he serious? i got to scream? And he looks at me and says, come on, scream. So he screams, and I scream. And he said, no, 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 louder, do it again. And he screamed, and then I just let out this big, huge, like, whoa! And started crying. And he's like, okay, roll camera, action. He couldn't use the first take because I was crying so hard that nobody understood a fucking thing I was saying. (laughs) Um, And that shit happened in two takes. And not that that's any big deal or whatever, but just to say that he's such an actor's director and, and he can make anybody comfortable. And he just knows what he's doing, man. It's like, I trust him. I would go blindly into any scene with that guy at the home. What were your thoughts? That's hard because you've got to really be vulnerable yes. as, as an actress. <laughs> and if you have a director who's more technical or this or that, and then you really have no help, you know, you're just kind of on your own, which is fine because it's your job. But it's just always so much more helpful when you have a director who is that much of an artist that he can incorporate his process and reach out into your process and sort of get you to, you know, because that's not character work necessarily when you do something like that. That's, that's, you know, it's not let's sit down and talk about, okay, so where is Jody from? Are her parents divorced? How long has she been in school? Has she been friends with Rosanna and these other two since kindergarten? I mean, that's what actors sort of work out like about their characters before they even start learning lines. They decide who the person is, which then colors how they would say something or what they would say. But this other stuff of like technique and I don't know if I'm going to be able to cry and all that, a lot of directors would just be like, dude, that's why we hired you. That's your fucking problem, you know, but not John. Hmm. No, no, no. Very hands-on, very actress director, very, very disarming. And, and just lovely. I love Rosanna Arquette. Also a lovely human being. Yeah. yeah she's... I speak with her, albeit on Facebook, most of the time. Um, she's a huge activist. She's got a huge heart. Um, devastated with her sibling, Alexis, having yes. passed. Oh, yes. Yeah. The whole family was devastated. Um and it was devastating to sort of watch unfold. Loss and death are very, very, very deep, deep things, you know, things around which minds cannot be wrapped. It's like once they're there, the next minute they're not, then there's a space that was once occupied by whoever it was. So weird. But, yeah. Um, that girl runs very, very deep. And her knowledge of music is incredible. Her love of music is bigger than the whole universe. Of course, you know? Toto um, named the song after her. That came out while we were shooting. Yeah. That started getting radio play while we were shooting. And it came on the radio, and she went nuts. Everybody stopped just to listen to the song. I remember that day. We were at the high school shooting. Now, of course, you were in Girlfriend from Hell, where you got to play the lead. (laughs) (laughs) Little typecasting there, Miss Curtis. Yes, I was in Girlfriend from Hell, and I'm proud of it, and I don't care what anybody says. T- talk about your experience making that movie. I could tell you put oh a lot my God, of gusto that was, in that. We came in, we. The director, Daniel M. Peterson, who also happens to be baby daddy number one of my twenty, soon to be 28-year-old. Okay. Um, Dan came in under budget and a day early. 
He had an 18-day shoot scheduled, and we came in 17 days. It was the most fun I've ever had, I think, shooting a film. Um, um, I guess one of my little diva things is, like, I don't like sharing my dressing room. I really don't. Okay. And I was given an option that I could share a dressing room with uh, an actor or whatever, or I could sort of share it with, I guess it wasn't really the production trailer, but it sort of was. So the first AD got to do his production work in the same trailer. I got to be a complete lunatic. So we hung out. Jeff. I used to call him Jiffy Jeff. <laughs> Jeff. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. Well, so Jeff and I shared a, shared a dressing room together. And that was fun. And Leslie Dean was a lot of fun. And the whole crew, fabulous. Yeah. Everybody was a little bit eccentric. Our producer, Alberto Lenzi, was this Italian guy. And he still, I think, owns and runs a restaurant on the Sunset Strip called Le Petit Four. Um, but, boy, he was, <laughs> he and Dan, <laughs> I remember one time they got into it and, I just, I always remember Alberto flipping out and going, I am the producer, like that. And it just, Dan and I, every once in a while, we'll just look at each other and go, I am the producer. I don't know. There's, there's just a lot, of, a lot of fun. I have a behind-the-scenes video that I was just asked um, by the still photographer, Eric Lasher, rest in peace, Eric, his good friend Stan said, Eric, and I used to watch that all the time, and I don't have a copy of it, do you? I said, yeah. So i got to get that to him, and he's going to make a CD or a DVD of it, rather, which will be good, because then we don't have to worry about the videotape disintegrating. But, yeah, man, that was a good time. That yeah. was a really good time. Yeah, you were the, the girlfriend that ended up being possessed by the devil. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Doing some very bad things. <laughs> yes. That's right. Maggie did bad things. See, I didn't. Mag possessed. Ma I'll take it a step further. Maggie didn't even know what she was doing. It was possessed. Maggie did bad things. But I think you know, women. We we get possessed. It's like in Bull Durham when he was singing "Women They Get Wooly," and then Kevin Costner says, "No, it's not wooly. It's weary, you idiot. Women they get weary, not wooly." Yeah. Well, women we get. We get crazy. That's more like it <laughs> sometimes. Well, how about Critters 2? <laughs> oh, that was another fun, 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 fun project. I actually still talk to Mick Garris and Scott and Tommy Hodges. Do I talk to anybody else? Mm. Do you talk to the Critters? <laughs> Only the ones in my head. <laughs> uh -huh. It's like the United States of Critter. <laughs> Forget Tara. I have critters. Um, no, I mean that was that was also a lot of fun. I like driving, so driving to and from the set was always very um, relaxing, decompressing. To and from, um, there was this uh, weird place that they used for um, drills, I guess, for police and for maybe army or fire, whatever. And there were cabins, and it was just like this really weird property. Um, and so they built a whole town right there mm -hmm. in the flat part of it, which isn't really a town. The whole thing was a big facade, although the production office was actually behind one of the doors. <laughs> behind door number 17.2 is the production office. Um, yeah, um, and that was a lot of fun. I like that. I like that. I got to hang out with the Kyoto Brothers. I talked to them, too, still. That's so funny. And I have pictures of my oldest child with critters. Okay. I do. Um, but shooting that was good. Mick Garris, he's a good director, too. Not as much an actor's director, more a technical director. Um, um, but I think because the stuff that he does is horror based it kind of has to be like more about the story and about the horror and about what it looks like and you know you just rely on your actors to deliver you know 
what it is you gave them in the or what they gave you in the room at the audition. Um, so it's a little bit different, but he was definitely a lot of fun to work with. Scott is a peach, really talented young man. Um, I actually listened to his music. I've downloaded a couple of his CDs. I paid money for Scott Grimes music. That's how much I liked it. Um, what else can I tell you about Critters 2? Mm. I still talk to the girl who was my stand-in. Her name is Susan Rome. She lives in Maryland now, and she actually got some acting work on an older show called The Wire. So she started working more when she moved back to the East Coast of all bizarre things. And I think she still steadily works in theater. So hello's out to you, Miss Susan, if you're listening. Well, one of my favorite musical comedies is Rock and Roll High School, and I've done a couple of interviews from that movie. I love that movie, and of course, you was in uh, Rock and Roll High School Forever, where of course Mary Warnov comes back as uh, <laughs> yep, and Corey Feldman is in trouble this time instead of P.J. Souls. Um, t- tell me about your experiences on that. <laughs> well, remember when I told you that the bird that I have that's the oldest bird of all of them went to the makeup artist that's Karen Karen did my makeup on that movie I still talk to her I still talk to Deborah still talk to Don Daniels I still talk to a lot of people from from that film um I even still talk to Corey I saw him at NAMM this last year the National Association of Music Manufacturers that goes on once a year he and his whole I will call it a posse of angels and bodyguards were sort of roaming through Nam, and that was kind of fun seeing him there. Um, that was a fun movie to shoot. I liked that um, I actually got to play music and that we got to go in the studio and record some of the backing vocals on um, the song Rock Us Danny. And the friends that I made on the music side, like sort of in the behind the scenes, um, I got to sort of reunite with 20 years later, and the very first uh, EP that my daughter put out, 101, was actually co-written, and five of the cuts on there were produced by Rick Markman, who I met back then because he was coaching Stephen Ho on playing bass, because I don't think Stephen was actually a really a bass player. Um, so, But that was a whole scene. That whole thing was just a lot of fun because our characters were just up to no good, always mischief after mischief after mischief. What so about was, what about Mary Warnov? Sweet lady, <laughs> love her. The opposite of her character. Yeah, um, yeah. I um, none, another film I got to bring up, of course, Benny and June. You got to work mm. with an unknown actor named Johnny Depp. Yeah, that's who. who? Yeah. <laughs> Who? Who? <laughs> what? <laughs> right, I feel like doing, you know, Jimmy Fallon. Johnny Dab. Johnny Dab. We, we oh, no. Now I heard of him. <laughs> yep. Sarah. S A R A. No H, because H is our L. I love that. <laughs> My daughter and her best friend Sophia do the best. Best, best Sarah and best friend. They refused to let me tape it and put it up publicly, which makes me really sad because it has made me cry. I've laughed so hard watching the two of them go at it. You need to secretly film them. Well, yeah, and then have them come kill me in my sleep. That's, <laughs> you know, no, that's really not how I want to make my comeback. Get the, get the birds to protect you. Murdered in my sleep by an embarrassed couple of teenagers. Get the bird. That's get, not good. Get your birds to protect you. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I, I highly doubt that they would do anything. <laughs> Beg for food. When did you get into uh, getting birds as pet? Have you always been a big bird lover? You know, I'll say it again. I think um, <laughs> I think it's my grandmother's fault. It's all my grandmother's fault. See, this is like I feel like now I feel like I'm on a shrink couch. <laughs> you see, Doctor, when I was a small child, my grandmother used to take me to Central Park and put breadcrumbs on my feet. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Oh, no. <laughs> no, and the fucking pigeons would come around, and they would 
like literally come and she would tell me don't move and so I wouldn't move and the birds would literally come up onto my feet in my stroller and eat the crumbs off of my feet and all around my feet well, as long and as... I thought that was so cool and then I'd always beg to let them you know to, to please can I get the little blue parakeet at the store at Woolworths and you know what they say you know it's what you tell a kid they can never do that they all want to do Right? So in my family, it was, we can have a cat, but you cannot have a bird. No matter what, there's no bird. There'll never be a bird. So when I became a teenager, I met up with a young man, and he decided he wanted an African gray parrot. Okay. And when we broke up, that parrot went with him to Minneapolis. And shortly thereafter, um, I came to Los Angeles. No, actually, I went and got myself a different bird. And that didn't last long. I ended up having to give it to a sanctuary because it was too much for me to handle. But, you know, now I'm down to 25 birds. <laughs> down to 25. But I think that's what happened. I think it's because my grandma used to feed the pigeons off of my feet. And so I've always sort of wanted to, you know, and birds are free. They fly. They, I don't know. And I used to have flying dreams when I was little. Unless you get an ostrich, they don't fly. <laughs> no, they just bury their heads and they, they they race. I could race my ostriches, and I could have like an ostrich run when when I grow up and make my millions. Some people want tennis courts and dog runs. I would have an ostrich run. I might, and I would race them, but only every third Sunday of the month. And you'd have to wear tennis whites, can... and have to have some kind of fancy drink with an umbrella in it to to watch. You can get uh, Molly Ringwald to ride one of them. <laughs> Maybe. But she'd have to dress like Mary Poppins and have a parasol. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. I just wondered, do you got any charities that you're involved in? I do. Yeah. I do. Plug them. Um, I have my friend Layla Steinberg um, has something called AIM. Um and she has been facilitating with art to at-risk youth and inmates for years now. So there's that. Then the Pab Love Foundation, P-A-B as in boy, L-O-V-E, which was started by uh, Jeff Castellaz and his wife, Joanne. Um, and they lost their son to a very violent, fast-moving cancer. Okay. And I think it was right before he turned six. So they started a 501c3. And my daughter has actually played benefits, or a benefit for them. We flew all the way back to the East Coast to do that. Um, and so we donate to that. And... There's another one called Angels in Fur, and that's where we acquired, I don't even know, like, people say my dog, my cat. It's like, really, is that animal really yours? Is it property? It's, it's a living thing. So the dog with whom I reside was uh, adopted from a 501c3 called Angels in Fur, which was started by a lady named Rochelle, um, who's a kindergarten teacher, when she saw a dog by the side of the road. And then, you know, she's been doing that for a few years now. So we'll do performances and we'll donate time and we'll do stuff with them. And our sweet little Yorkshire Terrier, Layla, came from there. So, yeah, I'm definitely all about tithing. Tithing is good. Giving is good. Do you have, like, a web page or anything that uh, people can... Uh... Uh, yeah, I do. I, I don't update it often, and I tend to revert to posts um, on Facebook, unfortunately, because it's just sort of like an immediate gratification okay. kind of blogging as opposed to sit down and write a blog and then publish it. I don't know. I'm, I, ooh, the lazy. <laughs> the word lazy comes to mind, which does not make me like myself. Two L words, lazy and not like myself. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, www.myname, L-I-A-N-E-C-U-R-T-I-S.com. Um, 
and I don't know. I'm like I'm a kind of a passive aggressive, and I won't even call myself a celebrity because I'm just a person. No, I am a person. I will not use the word just and <laughs> diminish. I am a person. I am a real person, you know. But my daughter, I love her, and she's awesome. You guys should go visit her website, www.jaqmackenzie.com. She's awesome. Okay. And that's what I've been doing for the past seven years is helping her along and developing her and managing her and making sure she had a balanced childhood in that she was never really homeschooled. She only started independent study halfway through 11th grade and is about to graduate high school. She got into the University of Oregon, and I'm very proud of her. And she works really, 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 really hard, and she's the real deal. And she's like the next updated version, right? Mm -hmm. So like if I'm a Pentium or if I'm a 386, she's she's an i7. She's awesome. Check Mm -hmm. out her music. Check out her stuff. Check out her website. Absolutely. And thank you. Absolutely. Well, Leanne, you know what? It was so fun talking to you today. I love your spirit, you know, and I love the, your, your uh, even with your f bomb, you know. I love how you just free, <laughs> freely just express yourself and say whatever's on your mind. I love that about you. I'm so glad I got in touch with you because you're well, you're. Thank you, thank you. I think that's my favorite and my least favorite quality about myself <laughs> is that I have no filter. But you know, at least what. Uh, so many people just lie for so many different reasons and on so many different levels. And I really try not to, I just try to keep my intention clean and I try to be honest and I try not to do things. If I have to hide it, then I don't do it as much as possible. You know, um, I don't know. I just, I I, I try to be real best I can because it's all I got. (laughs) It's all I got. You know, I'm just, I was going to say, before I let you go, could I get you to do a plug for my show? Uh, sure. Yeah. Just just state your name and uh, say you're listening to... Uh, my show's called Python's Paradise, Python Like the Snake. Say you're listening to Python's Paradise with Greg Gilbert, and I'm out of New Brunswick, Canada. This is Leanne Curtis, and you've been listening to Python's Paradise out of New Brunswick, Canada. Thank you very much. Leanne, you've been wonderful. I'm so glad I reached out to you. And um, like I said, do you mind if I I add you on Facebook? Of course. You should add my personal, though, because I never – see, this is so bad. It's like I really – I should have flipped it a long time ago and made my fan page probably the primary source of – the information I disseminate, which is a lot of TMI, a lot of very boring <laughs> live videos of my hunting for houses of all strange things. My dog walks, <laughs> rides with people in cars who feel like they're trapped by a lunatic driving them around. You know, just your, your usual Facebook live nonsense. But I don't know. Uh, I missed the opportunity. So please, please, please find me on my personal page, or maybe I'll find you right now. Here, hold on. I have yeah, yeah you'll, uh, you'll, you'll find me on there. I can do this. I will go into my messages. And you'll find... You'll Greg, find... and I forgot to say this is Leanne Curtis with Greg Gilbert. Do you want me to redo that? Sure, please, go ahead. This is Leanne Curtis, and you've been listening to Python's Paradise with Greg Gilbert out of New Brunswick. There you go. This is this that was that was fantastic. I was uh, that was great. I was really enjoyed having you on here. You find me on there yet? Um, view in your profile, and I just sent added a friend. Okay, there you go. Yeah. I just did it. There we go. Now we can stay connected, and <laughs> I can uh, send this to you yeah, whenever. Now you can see all my crazy. I can see. And a lot of times, I live stream my daughter's performances, like uh, because I play bass for her. Mm -hmm. So I'll live stream it. We play every Tuesday. Absolutely. Late, probably like right around midnight your time. Aren't you over on the East Coast, New Brunswick? I'm an idiot. I don't know. I'm 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 four hours ahead of you. It's four hours ahead. Yeah. It's even worse. It's not three. It's four. Dear God. Yep. It's actually one time zone out from New York. 
geez. Yep. It's actually after 5 o'clock here right now, so it's after 1 o'clock where you are. Well, it's time to drink alcohol. There you Sorry, go. That I really do. But it's 5 <laughs> o'clock somewhere is the joke, so I just figured I might as well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Leanne, thank you so much for coming on to my show. Uh, oh, no, thank you so much for reaching out. I'm flattered. Thank you. It was my privilege and my honor to join you and spend an hour with you. Absolutely. You take care, Greg. Absolutely. We're celebrating 16 candles, and God bless you. God bless you right back, Bob. Absolutely. You take care. You do the same. Be well. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye, Greg.